Well, hello, friends. We are talking about Matthew chapter 8, and we're talking about centurion faith. This is episode 76 of the Bible, verse by verse. And in episode 75, we talked about the first part of centurion faith, centurion faith 1. And uh, this episode 76 is going to be Centurion Faith 2. So we're in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, and we're beginning uh, at verse 5. We got from verse 5 to verse 9. Last time we're going to get verse 10 through verse 13 in this episode, but I want to read the entire event, okay? And Jesus was entered... And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say to you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it unto you. And his servant was healed in that self-same hour. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll go right to the word of the Lord. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness. And on our minds, our hearts, and our lips that we might perceive, believe, and speak your word with clarity and conviction. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. So we're going to go right to the word of the Lord in this episode 76. My, can you believe that it has been 76 episodes that we have produced now talking about the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, it's been, it is, it is a very exciting journey. It has been, it is being, and it is going to continue to be a very exciting journey. Now, we've talked about Centurion Faith 1. That's where the centurion introduces himself to Christ, introduces the, uh, the, the problem, his servant is sick with a palsy. We've talked about what that was, what that probably was. And uh, we've talked about the faith that the centurion had concerning the spoken word of God. And we talked about how the, how the centurion actually recognized the deity of Jesus when he recognized the fact that Jesus did not have to go himself all Jesus had to do was send his word. So the centurion was recognizing that it's not through any amulet or any type of, uh, of thing that Jesus would have to do in person, any kind of potion, any kind of medicine. It was his word alone that was healing. And when you think about what that means, what that means concerning the power of the Word of God. That the Word of God spoken in this place 
will produce a result in a distant place. Oh, friend, that is a powerful thing. Amen, it really is. I think of Elizabeth's words to Mary. When Mary came to her in Luke chapter, uh, the first couple of chapters of Luke's gospel, he gives us this account. And the angel came to Mary and spoke the word and Mary believed. And then Mary went and, and, and told Elizabeth what had happened. And Elizabeth said to Mary, blessed are you who have believed the word of the Lord. Because Mary conceived from that word that the angel spoke, <clears throat> that word she received into her womb, and that word uh, impregnated her. That word had come from heaven. Amen. Here, the centurion is recognizing the power of the word. This is the very one that John would say, in the beginning was the word, talking about Jesus, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14 of John chapter 1, that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now here we have the centurion saying, just send your word. <laughs> Amen. Now in verse 10, the Bible says that when Jesus heard this, <laughs> when Jesus heard the declaration of the centurion, just send your word, he marveled and said to them that followed. Now, those that were following him were the disciples and maybe some others from Capernaum that wanted to say, hey, let's go and see this miracle that Jesus is about to do. Uh, Jesus said, he turned and said to those that were following him, verily I say unto you, now, this is a proclamation of Christ that's common right before he is about to say something really profound. Verily, I say unto you, surely I say unto you, this is a true thing that I am saying to you. I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Amen. Now, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Now, the Arabic version reads, in any of Israel. He's talking about people. He's talking about people that were his contemporaries. He's not talking about the patriarchs or Moses or the prophets. He's talking about those people that he has found in Israel that are his contemporaries. Now, his mother should be exempt from this, I'm sure, and the apostles, possibly, though it may be questioned whether or not the apostles themselves had yet expressed such strong faith in him as this Gentile had just expressed. And it was the more remarkable that he was a Gentile and not a Jew. And from a soldier to boot, but as great as it was, as great as this proclamation was, he did not ascribe to Christ more than was proper. And which, by the way, is a clear proof of our Lord's divinity, as I've already said. For had he not been truly God, Jesus, I mean, he would have rebuked the centurion and not have instead commended the man for his faith in him. This man ascribed power to Jesus, which is particular to God alone. He is so far from finding fault in him, for thinking or speaking so highly of him, that he praises him for it and prefers his faith in him to an instance of it he had met with among uh, the Israelites who yet had far greater advantages of knowing him and believing in him than did this centurion. The Bible says, Jesus, and I say unto you, Jesus says to those who were following him, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob 
in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's break this down a little bit. Jesus says, many shall come from the east and the west. Now, it's clear that our Lord saw in the centurion the first fruits of the great harvest that was going to come from the Gentile world. And like the words of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 9, where John says, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, just like these words, what he now said contained by implication the whole gospel which the Apostle Paul was uh, to preach to the Gentiles. And just as John the Baptist said, you Jews think that you're the cat's meow, but I say unto you that unless you uh, uh, come correct, God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. And that is exactly what uh, is presaged, what is uh, precasted here with this centurion's faith. Jesus said, many shall come from the east and west and set down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, the idea here is set down in fellowship and have a commonality of the family. So these who prided themselves in being children of Abraham, well, they were about to become the losers and God was getting ready from the dead stones of the Gentile world to raise up a new children of Abraham. When Jesus said east and west, even without the formal addition of the north and south, which we find in the parallel passage of Luke chapter 13, 29, were used as limits that included all the nations of the earth. When he meant east and west, he meant from everywhere, from all around the globe. They're going to come and they're going to set with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the children of the kingdom. Now here, when he talked about the children of the kingdom, he's talking about the Jews. Those that were the, the natural descendants of, of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. These shall be cast into outer darkness. Now, when Jesus used these terms, outer darkness, and he, he uses it uh, other times throughout his ministry, our Lord here alludes to the custom which the ancients had of making their great feast and entertainments for the most part in the evening with candlelight. And the outer darkness or the darkness uh, without the house signifies two things. First, the state of heathenish darkness or of ignorance and error in which those who are without the pale of the church of God, the Jews, should be cast for their rejection of Christ. In other words, at the festival, at the feast, at the entertainment, you're in the light. You are in the house. But those are on the outside, they're in the darkness. They're in the outer darkness. The, 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 the rims of the heathen. Uh, and that's where the children of the kingdom, the Jews, are going to be put. That's where they're going to be cast as outsiders, no longer the people of God. But secondly, it means the state of future misery into which as many of them as continued till death in their unbelief should finally be cast with all the other hypocrites and unbelievers. And then Jesus said, there shall be gnashing of teeth from impatience and bitterest remorse and indignation against themselves 
as being the authors of their own damnation. Self-love indulged on earth will then be transformed into self-hate. Thus Jesus is referenced to gnashing of teeth. Nor is this weeping and the gnashing of teeth combined with darkness only, but also with fire. Matthew 13, 42, 50, and Luke chapter 3 and verse 28. Now in verse 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the same hour. Now, in closing on this centurion faith, there's a lot here to be unpacked that we should take a whole episode in, but I won't. I'll just wrap it up here very quickly. Jesus said to him, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. As he had faith to believe, that Christ could cure his servant by speaking a word, then it was done accordingly. Christ, by his almighty fiat, said, let him be healed, and he was healed. Just as God in the creation said, let there be light, and there was light. And we're to think, of it just in the same way. Now notice what Jesus does not say. He did not say according to thy prayer. He did not say according to thy righteousness. He did not say according to thy goodness, but he said according to thy faith. Amen. Heaven responds to faith. It is, it is the commodity that always gets response at eternity's uh, tables of exchange. It's the one thing that God would not say no to. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Therefore, it follows that with faith, we may please God. And this is my last observation here. My, it is a powerful one. And it is further to be observed that this cure was worked not so much for the sake of the sick servant that had the palsy as it was for the sake of his master the centurion. Therefore, Christ says, be it done unto thee. He doesn't say, be it done unto thy servant. <laughs> he says, be it done unto thee. In other words, let him be healed for thy sake and be restored unto thee, to thy use, to thy profit, and to your advantage. Now, there's a lot of things that could be unpacked here. One is the power of intercessory prayer. The servant wasn't praying for himself. We're not even certain the servant knew of Christ. But the centurion did. And the centurion sought for his servant's healing. But God did it for the sake of the faith of the centurion. And this should answer once and for all, can an individual be blessed by God on the merit of someone else's faith? Well, here we have an example of it being done. And another thing is that God to bless those who believe in him will actually bless others so that those who have put their faith in him will be the beneficiary 
of the blessing of the one who themselves did not believe and maybe themselves did not even know of Christ. Wow, that's a thought to be pondered. Amen. Let us pray together, beloved. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, my friends. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.